Susie Bates, welcome to my podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Um, we eventually, I, I, first of all, I, I can't believe this. You're from Dunedin. I'm from Palmerston North. We're in a studio in Notting Hill. Um, it's a bit of a yeah pinch me moment for me, I'm, and I'm super excited that you're here. Yeah, um, it took me a while to get here, <laughs> um, and I have been to Palmy North a few times, but yeah, Dunedin, I've never caught public transport in Dunedin except when you go to school trips on the bus, but yeah, I really mucked up the tubes today, but thank you for having me, and yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, now, cause I went for a big run this morning, and I was thinking, how how am I going to intro this podcast, how are we going to do it, and I... I thought I could, you know, reel off some of your phenomenal stati- statistics of your various careers with cricket and basketball, and then you you fucked up your arrival and you're over half an hour late, um, which is the most amazing. It was actually amazing. I thought this is a great way to intro it because, from an outsider's perspective, uh, your life looks perfect, and <laughs> then this happens, and it proves that you are just human. Uh, what would your teammates say? Is this if they heard about this, would they be like, "Oh, that's classic Susie," or is this like, "Oh, that's out of character for Susie"? No, I think they would say that's classic. Uh, <laughs> if they knew as well that it was sunny outside, so the decisions were based around getting some outdoor transport, so they'd totally understand that because I'm always out in the sun. So, no, it is a little bit classic. Trying to also squeeze a lot into the day and too much. When you're in Dunedin, everything's only five minutes away, so you're only ever five minutes late, whereas yeah, in London. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, half an hour late in London's per- perfectly reasonable. Like It takes so long to get anywhere. Like The friends I'm staying with, uh, it, Every evening they're like, oh, we should go and see Craig David tonight, for example. And I'm like, oh, cool, we're how far away is it? And everything's an hour. It takes an hour to get anywhere. Yeah, and you think, uh, you know, you can go on the tube, but then there's still a lot of walking. So you do get your steps up, mm. um, even once you figure out the tube. Uh, but yeah, it's been really nice to be in London. It's a great spot. And at least the sun is out. Yeah. And w- so what are you doing here? You're here for a, the, what's the tournament? The T100? No. Yeah, it's called The 100. So, um it's just a format that I think they've made for TV, so it's shorter, and it's 100 balls instead of 2020, which is 120 balls. And they've got uh, eight teams all spread out. There's men's and women's. You play double headers every game, so I'm of the Oval Invincibles, who are London-based, and they get three overseas, and they go into a draft each year, and you get picked and get sent to whatever team. So Sophie Devine's at Birmingham Phoenix, and... Mealy Kerr's at London Spirit, and there's a couple of the New Zealand boys, Finnell and Devon Conway are at the Southern Brave, so there's plenty of Kiwis in the competition. But, yeah, that's what we're here for, and it's a pretty cool competition. We play sold-out crowds at the Oval. Um, the atmosphere's awesome. We're not doing as well as we'd like this season, but that's all part of it. Mm, and even though you're on different teams, do you catch up with your, your Kiwi mates? Yeah, um, it's handy having Mealy and the other London team. So her and her boyfriend Nathan are over here and we've done a bit together. We played Sophie in Birmingham and our white friends coach Ben Sawyer is also there. So we had a catch up after the game. But there is a bit of travel and it's hard to meet up <laughs> <laughs> with people as you've seen. So not too much, but it helps that Mealy's in London. Yeah, yeah, you, you guys quite tight. Mealy and I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time together. I think we've just bonded over... Um, cricket and wanting to be the best we can be and Mm. she's very talented and we obviously tour a lot as a team so the three of us Sophie, Mealy and I know each other pretty well so it is nice when you have those familiar faces when you're an overseas player. Yeah because I I heard the story about um, Mealy Kerr and yourself and I don't know if it's like a like just a a punchline or a gag or a serious thing but she when you retire she wants you to be her like traveling personal coach. (laughs) Is that like is is that a real sort of thing or is it sort of shtick? Um, I think she'd love that. Uh, we've talked about, we have talked about, you know how tennis players, they kind of have their personal coaches and with all this franchise cricket, Millie's traveling the world playing in different teams. So she wants to take a coach that'll just sling at her for hours because she loves batting. So we've joked now that she's earning millions of dollars that I could be that person and just be her own personal batting coach. So when mm. training's done, if she wants extras, I'm just there to bowl and throw. So it's yeah. a bit of a joke, but I'm sure she'd love it. Yeah, Is she is that an exaggeration or is she earning millions of dollars? Uh, millions is probably an exaggeration, but the IPL, women's IPL, yeah, yeah. Um, first time this year, they had this auction, which was just absolutely fascinating to watch unfold. Smriti Mandana, the best Indian player, went for something ridiculous. Like she went for one point something million, the most highest paid female cricketer. And then Mealy, I think something over 100K for her um, position at Mumbai Indians. So 
she's got another 10 to 15 years if she wants to keep playing um, all around the world. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable considering when I started, I think we got paid $30 a day. <laughs> like her DMs. <laughs> yeah. <was it? laughs> and that was meant to, you got $70 if you didn't live at home because that was to cover mortgage. Oh, accommodation, yeah. I was living at home at the time still, so I got $30. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, uh, uh, like a, it must be it must be nice for you that um yeah in your career which by the way has like spanned over half your fucking life it's been insane insane it's nice that you've seen that over eh? thirty dollars a day to where you are now and that you do get to capitalize on it and make a little bit of money before before your career ends yeah and I say to others I feel like it's been quite a privilege to have the best of both worlds because I sort of look at these young players now and at 16, 17, they're contracted and cricket becomes their life, whereas probably up until I was 26, 27, 28, it was still part-time, I could play basketball, I could study. Um, I sort of felt like I had, I guess, more freedom to figure out what I wanted to do, and then cricket became my profession. Um, So I see the benefits of that. I could have been burnt out by now if it was the way it is. and obviously there's players also just before me that missed out just on the professional um, phase of <laughs> the game. It. So it. yeah, it's like the timing and no, it's no one's fault, but I just feel pretty grateful that I've been part of both sides for mm. different reasons. And yeah, it's a, the fine line because there is now financial reward, but um, not hanging in there too long and for the wrong reasons. You yeah. want to be making sure you, I'm still doing it for the love, but sometimes the money talks, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, 100%. And do you, do you find sometimes with the, the younger players, you, you go into like boomer mode and you say, oh, back, you, don't, you guys don't know how lucky you got it back in my day, $30 a day. Or, you know, it'd yeah. be hard not to. I though. catch myself all the time, <laughs> like, but I hold my tongue. They, they, yeah, it is mm. it's just so different. Like, they don't know any different, so it's not really their fault. No, but no. Um, you almost want to come... Sometimes I feel like I want to give them a clip around the ear mm. just so they've got some perspective, but that's not helpful. And I'm sure their older players, when I was playing, they wanted to give me a clip around yeah. the ear too. And is, is, so is the money good for you? So say you've got like another couple of years of your, your career left. Are you, are you going to better, you're like, I don't know, buy a house in Dunedin at the end of it? Or, you, you know, you've devoted so much of your life to the sport. Um, um, so in those early years in particular, like you definitely undoubtedly did it just for the love of the game. Um, and you've made a lot of sacrifices. So it'd be, it'd be good if you can get to the, the end of your career and, you know, you've got some financial reward from it. Is it going to be okay? Yeah, no, it's um, it's kind of unbelievable where it's at. And it's all public knowledge as well with these drafts they have now. I hate them, but that's where the game's going. You put your name in and you get offered a band of money. So this Oval Invincibles, it was, I think, I went for thirty two and a half thousand pound for a month's work. So, <laughs> oh, that's like seventy grand. Yeah. So that's and that's only happened in the last two years. That money's been that way. Um, the big bash, you can earn anything between I think it's thirty thousand and one hundred and ten thousand for six weeks. Um, the IPL, if you get your name in, it's the same. Well, the minimum is 30000 US, but it goes up to ridiculous amounts, but I wasn't picked up last season. And then our New Zealand cricket contracts, um, the retainers, and if you play every game, it's very financially rewarding. So mm. all of that put together over a 12-month um, span. I think the hard thing is now I think, oh, what job could I earn that money? <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. Doing something that I love so much as well, you know, it's my passion and it's just nothing's changed for me, but everything's changed. I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm sort of training the same way. Obviously, we're away a lot more, but then all of a sudden, it's like the same job you were doing now is earning 10 times as much. It's a weird concept. <laughs> oh, it's so cool, though. It is very cool, very cool. It's amazing. It's ama- oh, it's, okay, there's so much ground to cover with you. Like You've mentioned the IPL a couple of times. You you should have been selected, but you missed out. Is it? Uh, yeah, is it? I put my name in and hoped for selection, and yeah. I felt like I'd had a pretty good 12 months, but it is a very, I guess, fickle environment and... Often it's just depending on the balance of the team and spots. And it felt like the first auction, the Indian teams were looking for fast bowlers and all-rounders. And that was sort of where people put their money in. Lots of world-class openers like Danny Wyatt, Laura Wolvart from South Africa also missed out. So I think no one really knows how it's going to go. And Mm. you you hope that you're going to get picked up, especially when it was the first one. But... 
when you see how it unfolded, you sort of understand. But you, you were you were disappointed, or were you sort of okay about it? Uh, or oh, the timing Pissed of off. it. Where, like, can you remember how you felt? Yeah, no, I can because the timing of it was dreadful. Um, we were playing. Was it our second world? It was the second World Cup game. It was the morning of the game against South Africa, and there was obviously players in our team that had put their name in. And then I thought the auction was just going to happen in the morning, but then it just dragged on because they went through rounds and rounds. And so then I decided not to really follow it because we had a game. But then I could just sense on the bus that everyone knew that they were watching and that I hadn't been picked up. So mm. we had that game. And at the time, I was like, just not going to worry about it. But I think it probably just, I don't know, it just knocks your confidence a bit. We, like you feel maybe that you've done enough to be picked up and then when you're not i guess it does yeah it hurts a little bit but i think after the world cup and having a break i sort of saw it for what it was but at the time i was yeah a bit gutted and i knew people yeah. involved in the auction so you you'd hope they picked you up but they didn't so that was fine yeah like why are you like are you like embarrassed or just like sad I feel like, I, well, for me, it's more, no, it's not embarrassed, just yeah. gutted. I was yeah. just like, um, I'd done so much in the women's game and that was kind of one thing and it was the first time and I just desperately wanted to be a part of it and mm. see what it was like. And, yeah, I've been really fortunate that I've been part of pretty much everything when it started. Yeah. So it was just maybe for very selfish reasons, I just wanted to get amongst it and see what the women's IPL was going to be like but there's a chance every year if I want to put my name in it'll happen and it's only going to get bigger and bigger yeah and I, I suppose that's just um like the career path you've chosen isn't it there's like extreme highs but also these like deep lows as well yeah and batting and cricket if you've ever <laughs> been a batter you understand and like you just have to stay so consistent with how mm. you prepare because it it's very outcome based um especially as a batter and at the moment I haven't scored the runs I would have liked as an overseas player and that's even harder because you're sort of bought in kind of a commodity to go out there and perform for the team and when it doesn't go your way it becomes I think even harder in these franchise environments to deal with that because you feel like you're almost not proving your worth or yeah, they've yeah. put an investment in you whereas I think for New Zealand over a long period of time it's just a different feeling when you don't perform. You sort of got your teammates around you. You know you've contributed over a long period of time, whereas this is kind of here and now, and um, that's what you're here to do. So that's been a bit of a battle over here because everyone's sort of tiptoeing around it, but we know like we're pretty much out of the tournament now. So that's been a bit of a shame. Mm. But I, I, I'm guessing like um, you've been around so long, every imaginable scenario like you, you've you've been through. I'm sure you've been out for a golden duck before. <laughs> you've probably been out for 99 runs. Like you, the, yeah, the extreme highs and the extreme lows. So I mean, yeah, I, there, there can't be any scenario that you haven't dealt with. Uh, I've been out hit wicket six times. Do you know what that is? Where you like? <laughs> oh, well, you hit, hit the wicket your with own your own bat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, listen, I gave up playing. I loved cricket more than anything. I gave up when I was fourteen because I just got sick of playing a team sport where I was. I could feel I was letting my teammates down. I know very well what hitting wicket is. <laughs> yeah. So that's over a long time. I guess six isn't too bad, but yeah, you just. I don't know. It's it's such a metaphor for life, cricket, because. Mm you learn how to be resilient in the sport and if you have perspective you realize it's just a game but it just teaches you so many skills for outside of sport and you know when you fail dealing with that how you go about um, the next day how you are around the team when there's team success and there's individual failure or vice versa there's always someone in a cricket team that's failed and there's always someone that's succeeded and I think you just learn so much about your character in the, in this environment and putting yourself out there, um, knowing that, you know, batting probably, you know, 70% of the time doesn't go your way and so you always are dealing with failure and it's, I think, as watching young players come through, you can see the ones that are resilient and deal with that well and are able to kind of pick themselves back up and, yeah, there's lots of strategies you learn that I think are just really helpful in life. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, how how do you deal with that when something bad happens, like you hit wicket, or you know, you get out for a duck, or you know, you make a stupid mistake? 
you you wander back to the pavilion, take your pads off, take your helmet off. Then, um, like, are you, are you angry? Do you do you like? Are you upset? You burst into tears. What do you do? <laughs> I've gone through phases. Um, <laughs> younger Susie. Um, I used to be a crier. Like, I'm not really an angry person. I'm an emotional. So. There was, a, I reckon there was a couple of years where I just hated getting out so much because I had been quite successful early in my career and I expected that those results and I just used to like cry but like in the toilet. So like I'd get Oh, up. really? Like yeah, in no, private? Yeah, sad, isn't it? Yeah, well. Like trying to keep the noise the down. Teams, I'm, o- I'm an opening <laughs> batter so everyone else has to bat. So if you're a sad sack around everyone else, it's not that helpful. So I go into the toilet and like sort of give myself five to ten minutes maybe. This is one day cricket. Yeah, um, come back out with red eyes. Yeah, then come back out and <laughs> hope that it was over. Often it wasn't but... Uh, now I'm much, I think, just with maturity. I don't know. There's nothing you can do about it once mm. it's happened. And like, there's still times where I want to throw my bat or, you know, shout and scream. But um, I think I just sort of take my gear off and sit with the team. And then you just know you have to have good energy. And I sort of have a review process. You know, was it mental, tactical, technical, and then. If I need to, I'll touch base with a coach and talk about it. But by the next day, if I'm not over it, there's something wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you bounce back fairly quickly. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes that you have to do more work to for that, but mm. most of the time the next day the sun comes up and you've got another training or another game. We, we just play so much, you have to move on so quickly. Well, you, you, I mean, it's a good metaphor for life as well, isn't it? You do, you just have to, have to you know, just keep punching on. Mm. Keep doing it. Actually, I'm su- I'm surprised you, but you're um you're a, like you lean towards batting more than bowling anyway. Because you you grew up with older brothers, right, in Dunedin, played a lot of cricket with them. I'm guessing you barely got a turn with the bat. You would have been you would have been the 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 bowler, right? Yeah, that's probably why I lean towards batting. Oh. Because, uh, <laughs> I was sick of bowling, but no, my oldest brother uh, Tom especially just loved it. So. I'd bowl and he'd tell me to bowl even closer because I wasn't fast enough. And oh. yeah, well, I'd very rarely get a bat. And I think that's why when I first started out, I was kind of in for a good time, not a long time. So mm-hmm. yeah, but they're a huge part of why I got into sports. So they were pretty competitive as well. Yeah, let, let's uh, let's go right, right back and talk about that. So um, so you're from Dunedin, um, very high achieving family, right? Your parents are both lawyers. Dad was a tennis coach as well. <laughs> yeah, um, mum would say she was an athlete at James Hargis High School as well. But yeah, I guess that's where the work ethic came from. They both worked. Mum like looked after four kids. Dad worked really hard. And um, yeah, that was just the norm. We all went to school, went to sports trainings and mum drove us around. I don't know how she did it now. I've watched my brothers and sister have kids, just one kid. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that seems stressful. <laughs> But yeah, Dad uh, coached tennis and all of us started in tennis and we took it quite seriously but I think we were all more into the team sports and yeah, he played a bit of basketball so we were always down at the Dunedin Stadium bouncing a ball around and that was just what we knew and uh, yeah, didn't know any different and all our friends were at sports games and um, we were always busy. How, how much of... Um yeah, cause we'll get into everything to do with you. Like, there's the basketball, which you were phenomenal at, and and now the cricket. Were you? How much of it is like natural talent, and how much of it is hard work, and just the hours that you put in as a kid? What do you reckon? Yeah. There must be some natural talent there, right? But yeah, I feel uh, yeah, it's hard. Is it like an environment? I I feel like I guess more than some kids, I was just around a ball and kicking or throwing or passing with my brothers and with my parents playing sport that was just I guess you accidentally practice more and just have hand-eye coordination Um, and it probably wasn't uh, until I was 15 that I like trained or you know practiced hard I just turned up to practice and played it was a real joy of just playing games and then it was at 15 I started to take my cricket and basketball serious Mm -hmm. and then the fitness came into it and the work you needed to put in for that and then I guess wanting to get better, that's mm. when I probably started to work harder. Well, you say at 15 you started to take it seriously, but at 15 that's when you like made your like rep debut, right? And you played at Carisbrook. 
<laughs> so you so what, what, do you, what do you mean? You must be taking it seriously before then. Well, no, I felt right. like I... You sort of fall into it. I literally just played. Like, it was just like I was playing games and right, I loved right. it. Like, whether it was with the boys or the girls, I just played sport. It wasn't even... didn't matter what it was. Those were just... seemed the most accessible. And then, yeah, I'll never forget that because I didn't own spikes. So when you play cricket, you need the spikes so you don't slip over. But I'd never owned a pair and I got called in to play this game and I was bowling and I kept slipping. So mid over the captain switched shoes. So I wore her spikes and she wore my running shoes and I bowled 10 overs in a row. And then the next day, dad had to go out and buy me some spikes for the game the next day. <laughs> oh, what a story. So yeah. you were, so um, was it years then or was it, was it fifth form? I'm, I'm showing my age here. Uh, yeah, it was, was it years, years, years. So, so it was year, oh no, no, yeah, year 10. So you're in, so you're in year 10. Um, yeah, that's crazy <laughs> young eight. You look back now, from the perspective of a woman in her mid mid thirties, like you're a kid, was that was that um, intimidating at the time, or did you just have that like like youthful like brashness or confidence or cockiness or whatever? I just I don't know. It was like just come play a game of cricket. I just didn't really think about it. But so I wish it I still Ota- had that. Was it for Otago? Yeah, it was the Otago Sparks, and it was the end of the season, and they'd had an injury, and I think someone was leaving for the last round, so they just called me in, and it was like a game of cricket. I was like, cool. <laughs> I was just so chilled about it. And then I just bowled like I would on a Saturday with the boys. And, um, yeah, then I've played ever since. So that's why it's been half my life. <laughs> it's funny, hey? I, I interrupted you just before when you you said, I, I wish I still had that. It's like um, there's, a, there's a saying that the youth youth is wasted on the young. Um, and I suppose as you get older, you sort of overthink things. And, yeah. But you, so you, you, you don't remember being intimidated? Because I guess everyone else in the team were like sort of grown women. I just remember loving it. It was like whenever I played like the next level, I found it just so much more fun. It was like when you played with your peers or played club cricket, then you played for a tiger. It was like, whoa, the standard is so much fun. And there's, I've always enjoyed being around older people as like athletes. I looked up to them and I almost wanted to impress them. It was like with my brothers. I wanted to prove that I was good enough. Um, and I, yeah, it wasn't intimidation. I was just had so many role models, whether it was basketball, cricket, that I just felt really lucky to hang out with and go to tournaments and just play sport. It was the dream. Mm. And at 15, I'm guessing $30 a day or whatever was like quite a lot of money. Yeah, when you got the food money and I was living at home and they joked because I'd go and get Subway and then save, you know, pocket $20 so you could actually, you know, Do be right. smart with yeah, your money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Or play the old... They'll laugh at this, but the oh, I forgot my wallet every oh, time. No, I forgot yeah. my wallet, so I could save the full thirty dollars. <laughs> mm. So, um, and yeah, what was cricket like growing up? Because I've had Sophie Devine on the podcast, and she talked about being in like mixed teams. Um, did, were you in mixed teams, or were there girls' teams in Dunedin when you were when you were growing up? It was mainly mixed. I yeah. was just the club I was at. It was there was the brothers and then the younger sisters, and there happened to be three or four of us, so we kind of went through the ages together playing with the boys, but we always had two or three girlfriends in the team. So, um, and then got to high school and that was the only all girls cricket yeah. I've played. And even Dunedin club cricket, I played third grade men's cause there wasn't a women's club competition. Mm. So I think it was an advantage to play with the boys at that age. I think now, um, Girls do play mainly girls cricket, which has its benefits, but I think it was a bit of a tougher challenge. And um, yeah, I got sledged more in men's club cricket than I ever did in international cricket. Did you? Did you? <laughs> yeah. Really? They, like, like what? what? What would they say? Uh, like sexist stuff or? No, no. I'll never forget one because I think we'd played, New Zealand had played in a 2020 World Cup at Lords in like 2010, a long time ago. And then we were playing at Kensington Oval, and he was like, "Oh, from Lords to Kensington, like." <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> and I was right. like, "Wow, yeah, that's." <laughs> and just I had guys that I went to school with, and they'd just get stuck in, and yeah, I can't remember specifically, but I used to. Oh, find so it not it was sort of friendly banter. It was friendly banter, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I feel like international cricket, we don't say that much, or maybe I don't encourage um, too much banter. But yeah, is, is sledging a thing in the in the women's game, or or not so much. I feel like it's really toned down right. since there's all these overseas competitions. You never know who you're going to end up in a team with. So <laughs> <laughs> I think people. Yeah, yeah the mindful be, of that. Yeah, you, we used to play Australia and we just 
like you know there's this feeling of we don't like you and we never will like you but you didn't know them off the park you just knew them on the field whereas you started to play in their teams and you're like oh damn I actually kind of like she's some a cool of them yeah, yeah that's annoying I can't hate them now <laughs> although um yeah having Sophie Devine on the podcast last year again I, I don't know her very well just from the podcast conversation we've had but I I'd, I'd imagine she would potentially be a sledger yeah, domestically, there's her and Frankie Mackay, and actually Kate Abraham. They're kind of <laughs> the known ones to get into a bit of biff on the field. She has um, definitely toned down in her older years, but yeah, she she'll give it if she's in the mood. And sometimes, as a fast bowler, you feel like you can back it up. As a batter, the only thing that can happen is you can get out, and so there's no point, I guess, running your mouth off. Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> they and, can have the last laugh. And and where did the where did the basketball thing come from? Was that just like a like a, a side, like a, another sport, just something? So you had like, was it like cricket in summer, basketball winter? Where, how did you fit it in? Yeah, I don't know. How, like my brothers played. Like Tom loved the Chicago Bulls, so that was like the. Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen, era, oh, and I just Dennis remember, Rodman, yeah, Phil yeah, Jackson, his coach, and he had all the gear, and I just used to think he was so cool. Now, you know, he's my older brother, but um, how, how much older is he? Uh, he'd be f- five or six years, right? So, yeah, he, he, you know, it's quite funny from doing this podcast and speaking to so many sort of like high performance and people. Uh, a, a lot of something that a lot of people, like a huge majority, have in common is having like an older brother that I suppose. You know, older brother or older siblings that force you to sort of lift your game. Yeah, and I just I don't know what it was. He just was into sport, and so I hung around like a bad smell. And mm. I remember watching like Bulls finals, and then we'd go out and shoot on the like made up hoop. It wasn't I think it was like full size, but Dad had kind of made a backboard, and then Dad played club basketball, so I got involved in the club, and I just kept playing. I I, I loved the game of basketball; it was so much fun. I loved watching it, so. That's sort of how that started. But I gave everything a go, really. I played rugby. I played soccer. Mum wasn't happy because I started in soccer. And then I had two guy mates that we hung out, cricket and soccer. And then one year I went back and they'd gone to rugby. So I was like, I'm not playing soccer. I want to play with my mum. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but mum hadn't told me. So then I <laughs> ended up playing rugby because Ben and Ant, my two best mates, were playing. And that's how rugby started. And then I played touch at school and volleyball and then I think it was just cricket and basketball had opportunities or rep teams and that's where it sort of led. Yeah. Mm. So which which national team did you make first? Was it the New Zealand cricket team or the New Zealand basketball team? Yeah, the cricket team, sorry. I was just questioning myself. I should remember really? that. <laughs> <laughs> was, they were like one year after each other but it was cricket. My last year of school I got picked but I was actually planning on going to college in America for basketball so the coach at the time had heard that and I think he picked me to try and keep me in New Zealand because if I'd gone to college in America that may have been four years without cricket Mm. so do do you spend much time like sitting and reflecting on what you've done like it's fucking it's insane right it's phenomenal so while you're still a teenager you're playing cricket and basketball for New Zealand you're double international while you're still a school kid yeah, I you spend, know, yeah, are you yeah. constantly looking forward, or sometimes do you like do you pause to re- reflect on these things? Uh, it's probably to my detriment. I am always looking at the next challenge, and I'm probably I'm just so hard on myself. Which if I saw in someone else, I'd you know tell them not to be. But it's also, I guess, got me to where I am and mm. kept me going. But yeah, I don't know. I think when it was just happening, it was kind of. I just didn't think about it. It was like I loved those sports and then there was a team and they were so I was like, I'll train hard to get in that team and then I saw another team and I was like, oh, I want to be in that team and lucky I had so much support and financial support that there weren't those barriers to stop me from achieving that. Um, But yeah, I'm sure there'll be one day probably when I finally retire (laughs) that I'll sit back and just be so proud because I sort of set goals and then achieve them, which sometimes doesn't it doesn't work out like that. So. <laughs> yeah, it's it's insane, really. Yeah. Like when you think about it. But I, I I don't know if you ever will. I don't. I think you've just got that sort of growth mindset. I've seen other people on the podcast like this, um, in the latter stages of their career, like um, Hannah Wilkinson from the Football Ferns, Kendra Coxedge, and so yeah, Sophie Devine. And I feel like you've all got the similar sort of mindset where whatever you're doing in life, whether it's competitive sport or something else, you're going to be like looking forward. It's like a growth mindset thing. 
But you do want to pause occasionally and think about how awesome you are. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I could do with that right now, actually. I think my, my batting's um, been a bit of a yeah. minefield. And, like, yeah, just when I've got out there, just it's not quite going my way. And I've just got to sometimes stop. And um, actually, even with cricket, sometimes I do go back and watch footage because sometimes you can feel a little bit like out of rhythm in the middle and I'll go back and just watch my boundaries. Mm. And then I'm like, whoa, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes it's like an out of body of experience. You're like, did I do that? And they're watching video of yourself yeah. hitting boundaries. So, yeah, uh, maybe I'll take some time in the next couple of days while I'm in London people watching just to think how I got here. It's pretty cool, really. Yeah, yeah it's, it's got to be a weird thing. I don't, I don't know if this is something you can explain or not, but I, I suppose you have periods where you just feel like you're a hot knife going through hard butter and you go out there and, you know, you, you're in that flow state, the ball looks bigger and just nothing goes wrong. And then there's periods where you're in like a form slump and you try even harder and nothing goes right. Yep, that's exactly. Yeah, It's it? like the harder you try, the worse it gets. And... It is, it's like there's days and there's periods where you're batting and you feel like you have so much control of where you're hitting the ball, you have so much time and then there's times where you feel like you don't know where your next run's coming from and I don't reckon there'd be one batter in the world that's never felt that and you know what it feels like either way but it's being able to actually get yourself back to that space um, is easier said than done and yeah that's kind of I'm in that space a little bit at the moment where I seem to just feel like I'm hitting the field and then the frustration builds and you try harder and harder mm. and the worse it gets but the sort of like one score and then all of a sudden you're in that flow state and as a batter there's nothing better than being out in the middle when you feel like you're you just can't do anything you wrong. can't do anything yeah. wrong it's like a sort of like a zen space that lots of batters talk about where they just feel it's um yeah, kind of an outer body experience where it's just flowing and happening. Mm. I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I guess what anyone would tell you is would be when you're in a, like a, one of those slumps is just to like relax and have fun. But like, what does that mean exactly? Like, <laughs> yeah, have fun, and I'm like, yeah, but it's not fun when you're not scoring. I, like, it's fun when you're scoring runs. So it's like, just have fun, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, it's so it is sweet. You play with people all around the world and everyone's been in form or out of form whatever that really means but they yeah everyone's tries to be helpful but at the end of the day it's only you that can fix what's sort of going on upstairs and that's kind of like the beauty of cricket in a messed up way is that it's so mental and you know it's your mindset and that's you know the biggest test of character is getting that mindset right and being positive and staying positive and that's why I think it's just such a great game because that's what life's about too is mm. no matter what's going on, it's how you actually choose to respond. Yeah. And and, and um how do you how like how do you choose to I know you've you've got like um things that you do. Like I know you're into meditation and you'd like to journal. Um do you have much to do with a sports psychologist? Yeah, we've had over the years lots yeah. of those types of people involved and um I built a really good rapport with Gary Hermanson. He was actually at the 2008 Olympics, not with basketball, but as a psychologist. And then he's been around cricket. So we've kind of connected over the years. And yeah, I'll talk to him about lots of different things and touch base. And I don't know, there's just lots of reading. There's so many books out there and just taking snippets from different books like Mealy and Sophie love that sort of stuff too so it's having conversations about people's routines or their mental processes um yeah so there's lots of ways to get there and it's just making sure that you actually do it daily I think initially it was like when I was struggling then I'd go to that whereas actually just doing it daily and it's a constant process then I think you have yeah less of the ups and downs yeah much like much like life it, 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 yeah. it is like it is like that. Like it's like um, you know, the the last few years I've I've had some mental health like sort of struggles, and um, I've figured out what's good for me. But it's like you need that sort of like plan uh, in place the whole time, not just like oh shit I'm struggling, but now it's time to do it. Hey, you need those good habits. Yeah, and like y even though you know what you need to do, it's actually doing it. Because mm. when you're feeling good, you don't want to do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. And that's, yeah, it's like that self-care part of everything. And mm. like that's harder than um, 
than it sounds sometimes yeah. but yeah it's i don't know that cricket i think is just the greatest game for that sort of stuff because there's so many highs and lows but it's all in perspective as well but you still feel it because that's mm. what you do so yeah and i know you love your running and that's some something i really try and do when i'm on tour because sometimes you can play but actually like when you're in london just getting out going for a jog and millions of people realizing that no one really cares about what you do on a cricket field <laughs> at the end of the day you care but it's very small and the and yeah, the it's very insular. It's like, you're like most yeah. things in life, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard that. So you, you're you you're the one that's most likely to like rally up a few teammates and get out for a morning run? Yeah, we love on tour, especially later on the tour, everyone gets a bit tired. But <laughs> when we first get some of the run club, the White Ferns Run Club, and of, often there's jet lag, so we're awake at like six o'clock, so we're all excited. By the end of the tour, we're all sleeping until 10, so no one's up and about, <laughs> but... Yeah, I just think running is just such, this, like that's another thing. Like cricket is just such a beautiful thing. Like mm. you don't feel like doing it sometimes. You don't want to do it, but you never regret when you get out there and running with other people. It's like the endorphins and I don't know, getting up, going for a run with friends and having brunch. Like you can't mm. really be in a bad mood after that. Something might happen in the day, but if you start your day like that. So when we're on tour, I know like people get homesick, they miss their friends and family. I just think it's a great way to start the day mm. and like when we're in Sri Lanka it was so cool we're like running along and there's like police guys running with us the tuk-tuks there's like cows on the street and we're like dodging and all these people like clapping as we run past it was like 30 degrees and 90 percent humidity so they were like what are they doing but <laughs> we were just oh how good yeah jogging good. around goal it was lots of fun yeah I, I i agree like people say oh you love running but it's like well sometimes i love running and sometimes i fucking hate it mm. but there's there's one consistent with every single run and that's as soon as i finish i always feel amazing and i never regret it and i feel good for hours afterwards mm. whether it was a good run or a bad run it's magical. It so you, you mentioned the Olympics before. So you went to the um, 2008 Olympics in Beijing. That was for basketball. playing. So you were like 19 at the time, 20 at the time? Yeah, I'm 19. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you see, I've seen some photos, maybe on your Instagram of you playing. You look so young, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the freckles. Do are, I look old the, now? The freck <laughs> no, you, you still look incredibly young now, but, just, but you, you just look like a, like a, a kid. It's crazy. So, so you, you make the um, the team to go to the Olympics. Um, I'm guessing basketball, there's probably no expectation really of New Zealand to win a medal, right? So you, you're kind of there as a tourist, would you say? Or is that, would that, is that a mean thing to say? <laughs> no, that's not at all. I sort of have, I look back on that experience and like, I was so overwhelmed. Like I was 19 from Dunedin and I'd watched the Olympics on TV and I, I was like, man, that would be cool to go to an Olympics. But I kind of didn't think it was going to happen, but it worked out that Australia won the world champs, so we had an easier qualification. And I just got there, and every day I was like overwhelmed, you know, like you were seeing Roger Federer, you were like even the New Zealand athletes that we had at the time, like Valerie Adams and the Hamish Bonds and oh, yeah, Eric Murray yeah. and the gold medalists, and you were kind of in that bubble that for so long you'd just watched on TV. And, um, just walking around the village and there was free stuff everywhere and there's this massive food hall with a 24-hour <laughs> McDonald's which was like you just go up and order 12 Big Macs if you wanted but obviously <laughs> we were athletes um and yeah we competed hard but like we I don't know where our ranking was but mm. the fact that we won our first game and we didn't win any games after that but we uh definitely partied afterwards <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what you'd hope with the olympics i guess as someone that's that's never never been never has a chance of going you just want to get your event over and done with early so you can enjoy the whole olympic experience there'd be nothing worse say than you know having your event on the last day or something so did you guys take advantage of the mcdonald's or do you have it's, it's quite weird isn't it because i suppose they're a big sponsor of the olympics but you don't associate necessarily mcdonald's with um you know the elite yeah, sports people of the world. Did you have like a nutritionist or anyone on your team that's like now girls? Easy, easy on the Big Macs? <laughs> well, it was kind of like, and I, I guess going there with the expectation to win gold, you can't embrace it how we embraced it. Yeah. So yeah. It's, a, it's a different experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We played, we got there, we trained hard, we ate well. But when we'd finished, you can't, like, you stay until everyone leaves. What a shame. They probably do it different now with COVID, but like, the New Zealand athletes, we, I think we had nine days where we'd finished and we got to stay at the village 
And I was like, what do they expect us to do? Like, we, we just went out every night and we'd end up at McDonald's every night. And But there, it's funny, you turn up to the Olympics, well, this was my experience, and everyone at the start keeps themselves as very serious training and then it slowly just <laughs> capitulates to like this uni college party. And <laughs> there's unfortunate athletes that are at the end, but you can just see everyone just gets loose. Because for four years, some of these... Oh, Athletes yeah, highly strung for four years, yeah, just thinking about this every day. So we were part of that, and we got amongst it, and it was, yeah, we, those people that I had that week with are some of my closest mates. We just are spread out all over the world, and we don't see each other, but we had a good time. <laughs> mm. And your your whole family went over to, to watch and support as well. That must have been incredible. It was very cool, yeah. and... I remember sort of the moment that, like, with my older brothers, I was like, yeah, they've, I'm at the Olympics and, uh, like, I've made it and they, they're they proud of me. And I'm sure they always were, but that was kind of a moment for me. And I was getting them into after parties, so that made me feel like I was the cool younger sister. So I remember looking up in the stand when the first national anthem came on and they were all there. So, yeah, that was the first time probably in my international career that I'd had everyone um, watching mm. me. So were you like nervous at the time? Like, Have you ever sort of suffered like a, a thing called imposter syndrome? Or, or no, were you just sort of, I deserve to be here, I belong here, or you didn't, just didn't even sort of think about it? I think with that, I got dropped the tour just before the Olympic selection. So I remember missing out on the 12 and I was like, oh, my Olympic dream's over. But I gave it everything and I sort of accepted that. But that tour didn't go very well. So then I just was like, I'm just gonna train as hard as I can until this whole campaign's over. And they came back and like, unfortunately some people in that squad had failed, but I almost hadn't been in the coach's eyes and I'd worked really hard. And so I felt lucky to make the 12. So when I got there, I didn't really feel expectation. I knew I'd be on the bench, but I just, every time I went on, I was gonna give it my all. I actually had probably one of my best games for New Zealand at the Olympics against Spain. Um, and that was quite a cool moment because after that, I thought I can actually really compete at international level where I always felt Otago level, but the next step up and playing against proper international teams, I didn't quite believe I had the skill, but that was a moment that mm. I was like, oh, I can do this, yeah. Yeah, oh, good for you. And and uh, you mentioned Roger Federer before. Like, did, you, did you meet anyone uh, like at the Olympics? Or do you sort of leave them alone? You, you sort of see them from... Uh, well, actually, this is probably before, like, phones with cameras, right? Not quite that. Well, there were cameras, but... Or sh I, like on shitty Nokias or... Yeah, and I was... The, I don't know, I was too shy, which is a sort of a regret. Cause it's I the felt, most Dunedin thing ever, isn't it? I know, it? and you feel like everyone's doing... Everyone's there doing the same things. You don't want to pester. Mm. You're not like a fan. You felt like you were an athlete, and if everyone was coming up to you, you're going to be annoying. So... But I sort of regret that because it was my one chance. But we did meet the dream team, which was the highlight of my entire life. Oh, the US men's team? Yes. <laughs> did, well, yeah, what was the circumstances? Uh, <laughs> now, now you, I feel like I need to um, censor this from other Olympic athletes because okay. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be like, what What an Olympics they had. Um, <laughs> this, we went and watched the men's final and the security guard was like, everyone was cheering for Spain and they were like, if you cheer for us, you can come to the after party. And I don't even know how that really happened, but I didn't really believe it. We went back to the village and then next minute this girl was like, the, the bus is here, we've got to go, we've got to go. And we rushed out and it was the bus, the men's American basketball team on the bus and we got taken to this rooftop party. They had all these curtains pulled on the bus and they were like, no selfies, no photos. We had to go off the back of the bus, they went off the front and then we are up in this rooftop party with the dream team just hanging out. <laughs> so, <what laughs> Which when I say it out loud, it's still, I'm like, I don't even know how it happened, but it did. It's bonkers. <laughs> yeah, so LeBron James was in the team. Kobe, was Kobe in the yeah, team? Yeah, Kobe was in the team. You meet him? I did meet Kobe, which... Um, yeah, they were having a good time, the the men's team. But yeah, it was. What, you, what, yeah, what do you mean? You, what's the interaction or the conversation? Well, we just got put in this like booth with all these free drinks, and they were sort of sitting around. And one of the girls, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so embarrassing. It was like, she plays cricket for New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget Dwayne Wade, who was 
at the time one of my favorites he was like you're telling me you play a game for five days and you don't get a result <laughs> that's what he knew about cricket and I was like oh I was just so awkward and shy um but we just I don't know we just talked and partied and it, I just I don't even know I probably didn't say much because I was like so just overawed an awe. Yeah. yeah and David yeah. Beckham was at the party oh, too oh for fuck's so. sake <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow oh you, you almost overlooked that one uh, yeah no he <laughs> was oh yeah by the way he was an extra VIP section um, Dirk Nowitzki was around those Olympics he was um, a pretty big time player and yeah we just partied with celebrities Unbelievable! <laughs> I thought the All Blacks, you know, were cool, and then I went to the Olympics, and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's no, that's that's next level." So was Le- LeBron a big deal at the time? Was this, this fairly early on in his? Well, he would have. He was big deal, but he. What I remember about him is he came down the bus and he introduced himself to everyone, which I thought was so ridiculous. Like, "Hi, I'm LeBron." I'm like, "No shit." <laughs> yeah, we know, mate. Yeah, it's, isn't that I'm funny? Susie. Isn't that funny? Because. Um, I'm going to drop a name here. Nowhere as good as your name drop, though. But um, uh, one of my friends, Christian Cullen, used to play for the All Blacks. Oh, I loved Christian Cullen. And um, many years ago, uh, Tiger Woods came to New Zealand to play the New Zealand Golf Open in Parapara Umu. And Christian and, and a bunch of other All Blacks, they, they got the chance to go there and, and meet him. So they're waiting in the car park specifically for Tiger to turn up so they can meet him. And then Tiger gets out of his car and goes around everyone and does the same thing. Like, hi, I'm Tiger Woods. <laughs> and Christian's like, yeah, I, I know who the fuck you are. Like, we've been waiting here 45 minutes for you. Isn't that something? So LeBron's the same. Yeah, he yeah, made a point. It was really friendly and I just, yeah, I was like, hi, I'm Susie. Hi. <laughs> but, yeah, very cool. It was, um, I, I really don't even know how we got ourselves in that position, but it was um, the highlight of the Olympics, other than the first game that we won, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the, um, yeah, the New Zealand Olympic Com- Committee or S- Sports Funding New Zealand would hate to hear that. <laughs> yeah. The highlight of the fucking games is meetings. Yeah. Um, yeah so what do you, what do, you, do you get like a, a participation like medal or, or certificate, you know, saying you, you made the New Zealand squad and like what you sort of trinkets or souvenirs do you get? You get a lot. These, yeah. Um, it's actually really cool. Like you get a number, so you're Olympian. I think I was 194, and you get a badge, and that's your number forever. Um, you get like this photo board of every single athlete that attended that Olympics. Um, you know, there's lots of like we got a Ponamu fern. Yeah, and I've kept so much of that stuff. So like a blazer uniform, and I yeah just that you're an Olympic athlete and I think what's really cool is I got when we went with cricket to the Commonwealth Games is that was about meddling so I felt like I'd had the experience of participating and being involved and then the Commonwealth Games it was like we're here to win a medal and it was a different experience so I sort of got the best of both yeah ways. yeah yeah it's funny that eh? yeah two very I mean there's yeah so there's the, the the Olympics where you're going as a basketball player so no expectations of doing well um, and then you come with games as a cricketer where like if oh, you guys got a got a bronze but I suppose like anything less than it coming home with a medal yeah people would call you chokers because the ex- expectations are that high um, but also there's the age difference as well you're very young at the Olympics probably a, like a bit naive you know and then you're sort of old and experienced you know one of the like key members of the squad for the, the com games. Yeah, and it was, I like, remember thinking, like, there's so many distractions of uh, games, whether it's Olympic or Commonwealth Games. And I remember just talking to some of the young girls because I was like, embrace that, like, but know when it's time to not embrace that because mm. we probably em- embraced it a whole lot more back in 2008. But it was like, don't not embrace it because you need to get to the village, be amongst, it, be just an athlete, not a cricketer. But then when it's time to go to training and cricket, let's make sure we're here and we're doing our job and then we can switch off. And we had a lot of young players. So I felt it was almost a benefit to have been there before and know what to expect. But, yeah, to stand on that podium, um, that was, yeah, that's also one of my highlights. Mm. So um, it was Oh, so many, <laughs> so many. But there's been so many highlights. Oh, uh, yeah. And it, as we discussed before, you're not one that spends much time like looking back, but... Um, one one day maybe that time will come and um, fuck there's a lot of highlights to get through where, where is that bronze medal better not be in a sock drawer no do you know it was annoying as I because we were on the road after that for a long time so I had to send the bag home 
Um, it's in, like, I've got, because my parents moved house, and my house, I didn't want too much clutter, but I've got one box that sits in uh, my bookshelf with uh, that metal. I think it's got, like, I have, like, a hundredth cap from the White Ferns, and it's got a few of the really special things, but... Mm. Yeah, that's funny. You get those things, but you don't really sit them out on display. So sometimes. Oh, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe one day yeah. we get like just a room, a uh, dark room. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I have them, and sometimes I know when you're moving or shifting, you do get out, and you're like, mm. sort of reminisce. Yeah, it's a it's a very humble way to be, eh? I don't I don't know. Do, do you think that's because you're like from a from a reasonably small city in New Zealand, or is it just how you are as a person? Uh, I think it's probably how my family mm. brought me up and I've always had three siblings that I think keep you pretty grounded and I think it is a little bit the Dunedin and Otago way. We don't, I don't know, we... Not too showy. No, we're not showy at all and I don't know, I just always feel like what I do, and this is going to sound probably a bit bad, but it's sort of insignificant in the scheme of really important stuff that goes on I I get to do a hobby or a passion and it's quite a selfish pursuit so I'm like I know like I'm proud of what I've done but it's also not as important as a lot of other stuff mm. out there so I, yeah I don't well, know. What, what about your degree so you've, you've, you've got a degree like sports aside by the way I don't know how you've fit all this stuff up <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> cricket for New Zealand basketball for New Zealand and a degree to fall back on just in case sport didn't work out spoiler alert it's worked out just fine but m like most people I think get their degree framed and have it have it hanging somewhere shit my doctor who's in her 60s she's still got her degree hanging on the wall where's yours is it but in that box it was now in a box. It was hanging in my room <laughs> at my parents' house because that was that took me six years, and that was that was a battle because I started for Z school, and at the time I wasn't like I'm going to get paid to play sports, so it was really important. I was like, I need yeah, to get this yeah. done while I'm doing my hobbies, is what it felt like. But then there'd be a trip to India or a trip to England, and then I'd sort of put it off for. There's just something exciting coming up, and uni was just so boring compared to traveling the world playing sport. But I sort of just kept chipping mm. away, and I'm so glad I did, even though at the time. Oh, yeah, why? It, it, it doesn't feel like a waste of years. Like, you're never going to use that degree. No, I know, but because I was, I was still doing what I wanted to do as well, it wasn't like it was to sacrifice getting those opportunities I could train you know like you can't train all day so using my brain in other ways and uh, just to finish it and if it hadn't have worked out had I got injured or mm. something at least I kind of had that um and I I probably that's some with some of the younger players I'm like keep using your brain not to sacrifice being the best cricketer you can be but I think it's healthy yeah. So, what was your Dunedin experience like? Did you did you flat at all, or you just lived at home? No, my I see that. So I wasn't a true scarfy. Right. Oh, you you're like a, a bit of a nerd. I suppose you, like you were, you know, doing your sports stuff. So you're probably training a lot. You probably never got into the hole. But you've never done a shoey. No, it wasn't <laughs> great with the booze. To be fair, still, I'm still not. Uh, I think that's something to be proud of, though. Like, uh, New Zealand's got I terrible. I have an alter ego, Betsy. Betsy. So, yeah. Who's Betsy? <laughs> Betsy just that's what happens when um Susie has a bit too much to drink so we try to or well, when I was younger Betsy came out more often she, she makes an appearance every now and then there's a running joke like is Betsy out tonight or is it just Susie because Susie's boring to everyone else um but yeah I don't know I sort of was at home and not I didn't like flat or go into halls I flatted a couple of years later but I was sort of there trying to get it done and then I'd go off and play sports. So it was a very different experience. So you never went to a Castle Street party? I never went to that. I went to like the old Captain Cook Tavern, like the Sunday sessions occasionally. <laughs> um, don't, don't know why it was a bad idea. but <laughs> oh, I, Betsy, it's such a Betsy thing uh, to do. Yeah, Betsy was... Uh, so what's, um, what's Betsy like? Uh, when does she come out? Is it like three drinks, four drinks? Uh, probably three now. Three. Yeah. Uh, she just is very excitable and up for anything. Like sensible Susie and then Betsy is just like, let's go. <laughs> I reckon to get out of this form slump you're talking about at the moment, I reckon a couple of quiets and get Betsy out there. Give Betsy a go with the bat. We did give it a good nudge on Tuesday, the group actually. there's Because we, we played four games in eight days. 
And so there's this ship, it's like parked right outside a hotel, like docked, but they, it's like a bar, outdoor bar. So we booked a table and we did have a few drinks, which was nice actually, because everyone was a bit gutted after Tuesday's mm. game. So it is, there's a time and a place for it, I think, to switch off. Not, you don't always need alcohol, but sometimes as a team, that's um, a good way to kind of connect and... Yeah, let your head on a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so we talked about LeBron before and, and David Beckham. Um, I scrolled way back through your Instagram. Um, there's some other celebrities as well. Like uh, Charlie Watts, the late drummer for the Rolling Stones. There's a photo of you with Charlie Watts. Yeah, this, that's another I just don't know how they... I've just been in the right place at the right time. Um, so they loved cricket, the Rolling Stones, and they were touring... Australia and they were in Perth and they came to the Wacker for like a tour of the ground and we happened to be training and there was another overseas player at the time and they came and she was from England so then they met her and then we got VIP tickets a group of us from the Wacker we went backstage with Mick Jagger and I'll never forget he had like one shoe off like it was barefoot the other shoe on and had cricket on the, there must have been a test match on and they were watching the cricket what was he up to I don't know <laughs> it, was, it was so odd and well, I was, like, was standing, he in the process of getting getting dressed or I, he must have been we just came in but he just I just remember it was one barefoot watching the cricket but, and they just were getting ready to go on stage and then we had really good seats and I just remember thinking for his age like that performance was intense but mm. I thought he was going to pass out because there's nothing to him and he was just up and about the whole performance but yeah I that was pretty I didn't probably appreciate, appreciate it, it but yeah so what, what sort of um were you like a musical household growing up were your parents into music or did, did you sort of know who the Rolling Stones were or I mean everyone knows who they are but you fan of the music no, or not really see, I wasn't I feel like it was wasted on me because I I wasn't a massive fan I thought it was pretty cool but like I wasn't a huge fan my dad played the guitar and he loved singing and we loved just like around the campfire, the old guitar. And Tom was pretty into his music. Like I remember Pearl Jam CDs um, getting smashed on road chips. But I loved music. But, I, yeah, I felt like everyone was like, whoa. And we got drumsticks signed by Charlie Sheen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge oh, yeah, fan. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie Watts. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Where's that? Is that in the special box? No, I at have home? kept them because Tom was like, they're, they're worth something. So Yeah, and he's passed away now. When when yeah, this, this is very crass, but when these uh, celebrities die, the memorabilia that goes, that goes up a lot in value. Well, Not I've that still... you're worried about money these days. <laughs> well, I've still got them. So, no, no photo of Mick Jagger? No, because it was, we were, oh, we might have got a group photo. We were with the, um, the Western Cricket association there was like a group of us so Justin Langer was the head coach at the time so he was there um and we sort of just got shown around backstage and yeah, I just kind of was there for the ride but yeah Susie these stories are incredible <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, uh, unbelievable it's actually nice to sit and just you know talk about them because you don't go hey guess what I met Mick Jagger do you because you <laughs> Yeah, well, I wouldn't have even known this unless I went real deep on your on your early Instagram stuff. But it's it's amazing. Like there's never going to be another. It's hard to imagine there's going to be another band ever like the Rolling Stones. Like the fact that they're still pulling out arenas and stadiums, and they've been together. Like I think Mick Jagger just recently turned eighty. Oh, so yeah, they were like, incredible for their age. Like, yeah, it was inspiring stuff. Sure, and you you would have been frothing more had you met Eddie Vedder or someone. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Unbel oh God, I'm face palming. This Sorry. is unbelievable. Um, <laughs> Next I, time it happens, I'll just I'll give, get you the invite. Just, get, just get, get, at least do yourself a favour and get a photo. Mm. Um, okay, any other celebrities I need to know about? No, I think they're the top of no. the tree. Well, I'm I guessing think. every every cricketer in the game. Um, like who are you really tight with, or who who have you got that's like a mentor? Are there any mentors that you've got? Or is, there, um, is anyone like um say like if if, if 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 you know if you're batting poorly or if something happens does like Brendan McCullen text you and say hey I've been no, watching I wish you. Wish he did though. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, like not really from the men's game, but I've just had coaches over the years. Um, so Craig coming at the moment is the Otago women's coach, and so he's kept in touch and like he's really supportive. Uh, Warren Lee's who used to coach. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, now sort of retired and Clyde, but I'll ring him every now and then and he just makes me laugh really. But he coached Otago for five years, coached the White Ferns for one tournament and I just really enjoyed his philosophy. So he's been a bit of a 
I guess just someone to chew the fat over, especially when I was captain and like struggled with some of that stuff just to talk to a voice that was outside of the group. Um, Mike Shrimpton probably had the biggest influence on my batting, but he passed away sadly oh, probably 2014, just mm. when I'd done a lot of work with him for my batting, but like he just got the mental side of the game and you could talk to him about anything. So he was a huge influence and... Yeah, those are probably the people yeah. that I go to other than my family. And, um, you know, there's people in the cricket team that you you talk to, like, um, yeah, like Amy Sathway was around, Katie Martin. So I feel like I've always had people around that you can talk to about anything, which is really important when you're away from your family and friends for so long. You need those people. Yeah. And it's not everyone, but there's people that you're closer to. Yeah, Um yeah, let's talk about Amy, Amy Satterthwaite. Sat That's pretty good. It's, <laughs> it's Satterthwaite. Uh, Brian, you call her Branchy. 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 Yeah. yeah, there's, um, uh, stalking your Instagram, there's a, a post that you wrote to her maybe about a year ago um, after she m missed out on selection. It's a heartbreaking post, by the way. It's like a, it's a, it's a beautiful tribute, but it's, um, it's a really hard read. So she just wasn't selected for the team. Yeah, we after the Home World Cup, the expectation was that we'd make the semi final, and we just had some really close games, and we didn't perform as a senior batting group, and we haven't perhaps nailed that in the last few World Cups, and they made some massive change, and Amy and Katie Martin retired through her own will, but Amy was keen to keep playing, and they made that decision for her, and. Yeah, it was just really hard at the time because I felt like we were very similar in terms of our age, our experience, our contributions to the team. And I sort of thought, why her and not me? It could have easily been either of us. And yeah, it was kind of a kick up the bum as well to not take your position for granted, mm. which I don't think I ever have, but it was just a reminder. And yeah, I just really felt for her because she desperately wanted to keep playing and someone else made that decision. I know that happens in sport and that yeah, it's, no one's, it's no one's right to keep playing. But, yeah, just what she'd done for the game, it was hard to watch. And, yeah, we miss her around the group. But, um, obviously, with Leah and the team and Grace, their little girl, travelled with us a lot. So mm. we've stayed pretty connected. But, yeah, she's moved on. But I think it's just sad when, you know, it's done that way and probably wasn't the best way it could have been managed so you feel for you feel for her and you just hope that you get the choice but you may not <laughs> well that's a th that's the thing you, you only go out two ways eh? and I, I suppose that's the thing knowing when to when to pull the pin and you love it so much that you don't want to pull the pull the pin unnecessarily early but yeah yeah that's a tough one yeah I mean everyone would want to go out on their own terms I guess eh? yeah and very few athletes I think in mm. cricket get that opportunity so I think that's accepting that and having that as a realisation. But, yeah, I, I have to think about that constantly. Like, when is, when is the right time? Because this is – it's hard when, like, this was your dream and this is all I've wanted to do, whether it was cricket or not, be an athlete. Now I'm living my dream. You're financially rewarded. So it's sort of, yeah, not hanging in too long. You want to make sure you're still contributing. Um but maybe sometimes you need someone to tap you on the shoulder. Maybe you just... <laughs> Come on, mate. Yeah. You've <laughs> Betsy, you've overstayed your welcome. <laughs> and you, or yeah. you have the opportunity to go out. But, yeah, I don't know. I just know once mm. I'm done, it's forever. And that's exciting. Um, but I just love it. And I... You know, some people don't enjoy training anymore or touring. I'm a pretty good tourist and I love training. It's just that purpose of getting up um, and achieving. So... Yeah, it's, there's going to be a void no matter what, but I'll probably mm. go out running and maybe I'll join you on some some events. Yeah, you, you do some <laughs> runs. I've heard that you're quite keen to do the Old Ghost Ultra at some point. I think that looks so cool. I, yeah. Yeah, I do. Because I'm not road running probably with, I've had a few sort of plantar fascia and heel issues, but I love the trail running, just being in nature. So I do think once I finish, I'm going to enter some sort of race a year mm. out. So it, gives me that kind of motivation mm. but we'll see what that is yeah like maybe old ghost is a bit far first up <laughs> i think it's yeah what is it 89 k's 89 k's i think yeah. um I, I, whatever happens next so I, I i i've got no doubt that you'll be sweet like um yeah the, some of the people i've interviewed on this podcast it's like 
um, the sports side of things ends. But it's whatever you do next, you're going to be fucking good at because it's like these transferable skills. You know, your your discipline and your work ethic and the growth mindset you've got. So whatever you do, you're going to be amazing at. May not be on the same sort of stage, but you're going to be you're going to be good because it's just how you are as a person. I think that's exciting too. Yeah, and it is, and you mm. kind of don't know until you mm. stop because this takes up so much of your time, but. Um, I think it's a really nice place to be in because I've kind of accepted all of that and know... You're at peace. Yeah, I'm at peace with what I've achieved and what I've done and I know it'll end and, like, I've just loved... Honestly, like, I've loved all aspects of it. Like, I've loved the hard times, which sounds so silly, but I think the good times have just been so much better because there's been some struggles and, like, you feel like... Even back in the day, you felt like women's sport just wasn't appreciated or you know what you did wasn't valued and now it is and that's a yeah. really cool feeling yeah yeah well um so Kendra Coxage who I, I had on the podcast after the uh, the Women's World Cup last year um she was saying in the early days like they'd hand me down jerseys and we're flying economy class everywhere and so she's probably in a different sport but similar situation to you where she's got the privilege of you know going through mm. those bleak years and having some enjoyable years at the end yeah, and it's it's just the feeling of it was kind of like no one really took notice or cared. As that's a strong word, but um, and then no, it was no. kind of like there was a phase where I reckon people pretended to care and tried <laughs> really hard to invest in care, and then it was like the genuine care and passion and like understanding that. And it's not just in cricket; we've watched it unfold in all female sports where they saw, you know they've seen on the same level as their male counterparts and mm. like it's genuine and that's what's really cool watching the football world cup at home like that first game gave me goosebumps and every time i see packed out stadiums for female sport i just it, like makes me so happy yeah oh no it's 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 amazing um and the, the next a friend of mine has got a nine-year-old son called benjamin and he has, sometimes he'll get out of bed in the middle of the night and she'll be like What's the noise? And he'll be in the TV watching whatever, whatever crickets on TV, women's, men's, whatever. You know, some obscure like Indian mm. league thing in the middle of the night. He'll be watch, watching the games, and it's like, yeah, you guys are you guys are heroes now. So, Eli, who do, when you were growing up with your brothers, who who were you? Who were you pretending to be? Were you like um, like uh, Chris Keynes, Nathan Astle, <laughs> Mark? Probably not Mark Richardson. No one was pretending to be Mark Richardson. No. Um were you I one of the boys that, or one of the girls? No, it was one of, that's the thing. Is they, What is cool, though, they played the 2000 World Cup, which New Zealand won, on TV. And I'd watched boys and I was like, Nathan Astle's so cool. But you kind of didn't, it's not like you want, you couldn't be them, so you didn't think about that. You didn't have aspirations to play for New Zealand. And it wasn't until I saw the White Ferns, I was like, cool, like, I want to be a White Fern. Mm. And that's what is so cool now is like, young girls can be and boys can be anything they want to be because it's in their face and it's like the norm so it's not like women's sport or men's sport or women's cricket men's cricket it's just cricket and they 100 percent. a boy could their favorite player could be sophie divine it could be kane Susie, williamson could it be could be Susie me Bates. it could and like they don't if a girl was playing in their cricket team you know it was a bit in my day it was like oh this they're a girl, whereas now it's just like the norm, and that's yeah. they don't know any different, which is really cool. Yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. And how's how's your mental health been over the years? I mean, it's a, it's a, a tough sport. I mean, you said before, like it's mentally a big thing. You, has your mental health been good? I mentioned Sophie's been on the podcast, and I'm guessing yeah. you were sort of with her in the squad at that time, where she had like a horrendous breakdown. Has yours been good? Yeah, like I feel like everyone's got a spectrum of. Mm mental health and obviously Sophie and Mealy have had real battles and they've been really open about it which I think has it's really fabulous. helped players in our environment and they've talked about it um yeah I feel like with my mental health there's been times when it's been low on the spectrum there's times when it's up here and I've always felt like I've had really good support and strategies and knowing what to do when I'm here. I've never felt like I haven't been able to take care of myself. Yeah. So I've never been at that end where some people have. Um, yeah, I kind of, I guess I just know what I need to do 
to stay positive, to look after myself, and a lot of that is exercise when I'm away, eating well, connecting, and I've never been at that point where I can't do that. Um, I had a real struggle, I think it was 2014, I, I was really stressed about a lot of things going on at the time, and my body just sort of shut down on me, and... I just remember waking up and I had pins and needles in my feet and was about to play a cricket game and I said to the physio, both my feet had pins and needles and I was like drinking a lot of the time and I was a little bit homesick and I had a few things I was dealing with and then played that game and then the next day the pins and needles were like up my legs and I was like, this is not all good and flew home and went to the physio and she was like, you need to go to the doctor and then I was sort of like numb down and I was, I don't know, I was just, there was a lot going on, like inner turmoil and I was just stressed. What, what brought it on? Was it cricket based or no? It was a little Personal bit, stuff. Cra- it was just, you know, that age where you're just so, un- I was just uncertain about everything. Like I was kind of probably mid twenties where I wasn't sure cricket wasn't really career. So I was like, what am I going to do? I was always away from home and I was sort of following, the, it felt like I was following this pointless dream because... I wasn't really earning mm. and I sort of was just worried about everything. I was worried about my future um, relationships, just there was a lot going on. And yeah, then I went to the hospital and had a scan and I was actually diagnosed with mild MS and that was probably like the hardest thing because I couldn't feel my legs. I remember going for a run the next day and like I couldn't, I could, had sensation, but I didn't have full sensation. And I went to run and I just burst into tears because I was like, where are my legs gone? And like what I did was physical. And my coach, Warren Lees, at the time, we had a game for Otago and he was like, just come. Because with MS, you don't know, like the symptoms are there, you don't know if they're going to... So, so that's multiple sclerosis. Yes, what, yeah. what does that mean exactly? Well, I've, I've got multiple sclerosis right. and I had a relapse um which i believe was brought on by stress and i've obviously mm. got the gene rust i'm susceptible to it and i had a relapse which caused um feeling sensation gone and then i took about a st- steroids and then got put on a medication for the rest of my life pretty much and mm. that thankfully that bout of steroids got rid of those that relapse and this medication has controlled the symptoms and but I do think it's a lot of down to physically and mentally looking after myself and I think had I not potentially had that episode my mental health wasn't in a great place but I learnt physically and mentally what I needed to stay healthy and Mm. yeah that was just an appreciation of your body I don't know well, I was at a young age where I was invincible and I've always been able to do whatever I liked but that was like whoa if you don't look after yourself you're not going to be able to do this um yeah, does, does it flare up now or no no I've been so lucky this medication um yeah it keeps it under control and yeah there's probably certain things that may flare it up and I may never have a relapse again mm. With or without the medication, there's so many unknowns. I think that's the hardest thing about it, and there's so many different levels of symptoms. Um, but it, yeah, initially, I everything I did was affected it, but I'm so much more relaxed. It's like I live with it, and um, it just, hasn't affected my career. Yeah, you just find a way to like coexist with it. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, one thing I've I've got from this podcast journey so far is you realise like everyone everyone at some point is going to deal with some adversity. Like it's just part of being a, a fucking human. Um, and it, uh, there was another story I heard about you. you. You had a coach, I don't know how old you were, but um, you got told that you had the skill but not the fitness. When was this? Was this younger? Yep, that was... Like um, teens, 20s? I reckon I was 15 or 16. Right. And what, does I, that, what does that mean exactly? Well... Is it basic, basically a nice way of saying you're... you're carrying too much weight or...? Well, that's how I took it. Um, I, To be fair, like on reflection with um, maturity, I, I'd i broken my collarbone and I had literally sat on the couch and put on weight. So then I just went, <laughs> you know, like mum felt sorry for me. So she was feeding me like, oh, I have this cake. I'm so sad that you've got a broken collarbone. 
And then I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not like you, you could walk to the kitchen yourself and prepare a healthy snack. Yeah. Exactly. And I, the Football World Cup was on and I just sat in this lazy boy and watched the Men's Football World Cup, whatever year it was. Um, and then went to a under-18 New Zealand trial and the guy afterwards was like, do you want the good news or the bad news? The good news is um, your skills, are, your skills mm. are up there. They're good enough, but you're not fit enough to play international basketball. And I just remember going to mum and I was like, oh, he said I'm fat and I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to play cricket. And I, for two weeks, sulked. Um, and then I decided, because I'd played sport, but I hadn't consciously done fitness. I'd just played sport and yeah, been active. Yeah. And that was like, went and saw a trainer at the Moana Pool Gym and learnt to train outside of my sport. And it probably caused maybe a slight addiction to exercise because that was always when I was making teams I'm going to prove that I'm fit enough mm. so it became almost a little bit You're like hyper a, fixate on yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, like that's a box that I can control I'm going to be fit and sometimes I'd overdo it and sort of get the balance wrong but at that level of fitness and to be able to play two sports it was important it was mm. just later on I probably got the intensity and um just resting and recovery as well mm. is just as important. So so a slap in the face like that, I, I mean, it, at 15, you're not overly mature anyway. Um, but like how long how long are you sulking about it for? Or, you know, how long does it take before you go, right, well, fuck you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove you wrong and bounce back from that? I reckon two weeks I was quitting and playing cricket. I've got cricket, like, I don't need basketball. Like, <laughs> yeah, screw you. Yeah, Shane Warne, you see why not? I can be as fat as I want. They've never said I need to be fitter. Um, and then after that, I realised I wanted to play basketball and like, perhaps he had a point. <laughs> um, but then I reckon playing basketball, it was there the whole time of my international career that I needed to prove my fitness. So that was through like beep test. It was always like a determination to be in the top mm. sort of tier. And I probably hung on it for like far too long. But I don't know. Sometimes when you have the bit between your teeth and you want to prove people wrong, it's not the most healthy mindset, but I think it also drives you. Oh, no, I, 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 I love it. I, I love using haters as my motivators <laughs> yeah, yeah. because people that want to see, and I, not, not that he did, but people that want to see you fail, it's like flipping them the bird and saying, fuck you by doing well. But also it's good for yourself to do yeah, well. Yeah. And believe, like telling when people tell you you can't do something, it's like, actually, I believe I can. And that's quite powerful without having to flip the bird sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this this might be a personal question. You can tell me to piss off if you don't want to answer this. But do you do you, do you like want to have a family down the track? Do you hope to have kids? Yeah, I go through moments. Mm. Um, my oldest brother didn't have a kid until he was in his forties, and so my two brothers have got sort of eighteen month year old boys, and so my parents are in their seventies and had to wait a long time so it wasn't <laughs> just me I know oh. poor mum she was I think she was desperate but finally <laughs> now it's all happened at once my younger sister Olivia's just had her first actually when I was on the flight over here she came early so Marley, Louis and Porter and it's hard to imagine with what I do and it being sort of such a selfish pursuit and relationship wise it's even difficult um I can't quite see it, but then there is part of me now that my family's had kids, especially my sister, that I'm not putting it out of the question, but mm. I, I'm i sort of 50-50. I, I feel like I'd be a great mum and I'd love it. Um, yeah, you would. But, yeah, but you're, at, you're at peace, though, if, um, yeah. if it doesn't happen. Are, are you are you in a relationship? Uh, not currently, but uh, I've had some long-term relationships yeah. that have sort of, through COVID as well, um, were a bit challenging um, but currently, yeah, no. Um. I don't, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know how you could make that work. Like, how how many months of the year are you on the road this year? Um, well, I'm here, and then this finishes, and I go from here to Barbados, so it's just not a tough life, really, <laughs> <laughs> to play in a Caribbean league for a couple of weeks. And then I do get home for five days, and then we go to South Africa with White Ferns. And we go straight from South Africa to Sydney. So that's until December. So from now until December, we get like four or five nights at home. So, And I kind of make that choice 
like I don't expect someone to accept that you know like there's um there's been people but like I choose to keep doing this and yeah I sort of don't expect them to make that sacrifice and I and I'm also at peace with that and I know there'll be a time when I'm not doing this but um, my family like are good at traveling around and I've seen them and yeah I, I like there's a lot of same sex relationships in cricket, but I do believe that's part of it because you're away so much. It's really hard to Form a when they're in the environment, yeah. they're there. Um, and you know, it's only starting to change now where players are earning enough to perhaps fly their partners over. Whereas in the men's game, they've been earning money and their other half could potentially not work, so they could travel with mm. them. So there's just those dynamics that are starting to shift. That I think it will be easier to. Um, be able to travel with your partner even when you're on the road so much. Yeah, well, I suppose like every decision in life comes at comes at some sort of cost, doesn't it? And it sacrifices. Yeah, and I've always like had a coach, and I'll never forget it. He was like when we weren't paid, but we were playing for the White Ferns, and he said, "Just remember, like this is a choice, not a sacrifice." So like, I don't feel like I've sacrificed life to do this I've chosen to take this path and I wouldn't have done it any other way and that comes with benefits and it comes with missing out on stuff but I've consciously made that choice and there's consequences to that but Mm. like I also wouldn't go back and change any of the choices I've made no shit no yeah (laughs) shit no it's been a hell of a life Um, (laughs) do you you enjoy the um like the, the travel and the suitcase life or does it get a bit tedious must get tedious at times yeah you 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 get used to it and like, probably in a bad way, sometimes when I've lived this lifestyle, I get to Dunedin and I'm there for a week. <laughs> it and feels at like a year. Five o'clock, I'm like, <laughs> 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 what am I going to do? I like cook dinner, go to bed. I'm like, oh wow, this is mundane. But then I sort of get back into that rhythm, and I'm like, oh, this is nice. So that's probably a reflection of how I have lived. Um, yeah, you you miss your people. Like even in this environment. I'm lucky to have some Kiwis here, but they're not your people. And I think there will be a point where that outweighs the touring life where I just want to be around my people more. Mm. And what what are you, have you thought about what you want to do afterwards? Like, do you still want to be involved in the game, like in commentary or coaching or anything, or something completely different? As I was saying before, like, I reckon with like transferable skills, like, whatever you do, you'll be fucking great at. It's good. It's, and, 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 and another thing, like, so when it, what are you, 35? Yes. So I'm, I'm 50 now. When I was 35. Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. No, you're, you're doing good. When, um, when I was 35, I thought, like, 50 life was over. And then you get there and it's like, I went out for a 20K run today. I've got to stretch a lot more afterwards because my knees aren't what they used to be. But it's like, it's exciting when you get there and you realize there's still a lot of life left to live. So all the stuff that you've done over the last like 20 years in cricket, you could do that again with something else, something completely different. And it's fucking exciting. But yeah. have, you, have you put much thought into that? I've put a lot of thought because of just, especially since I think Amy and Katie left the game, that kind of, I've started to, I've started to just prepare for that. Mm. Um, and part of me, I've done this for so long that you kind of become institutionalized by cricket and the bubble that you're in and the people. <laughs> Sometimes that's the only people you see. And I also love talking and meeting other people. So part of me wants to remove myself a little bit, but I feel like there's so much I have to give to the game. Um, and maybe that's a bit further down the track, but I've made sure like I'm doing my level three coaching course so I can coach. I've done some commentary at home and actually the BBC gave me an opportunity yesterday, which was really cool. I just think the more you do that sort of stuff, um, the better you get. So Was that your first time with the doing the commentary stuff, the stuff with the BBC? I've done some with Sparks, but when I was right. injured, um, and then that, I've done like the odd bits and pieces, but that was sort of thrown into it and um, I enjoy talking about the game and especially when it's the women's game so I sort of feel there's an avenue for that like why not do it um, when there's so much going on uh, but there's also a part of me that is excited about doing something completely different and I still think it'll be in the health sport women's sport area um, but not necessarily cricket. Mm. So definitely not um, phys ed or nutrition, that bloody six-year degree. Well, no, um, yeah, probably not. <laughs> well, whatever, whatever it is, um, it's it's bloody exciting. Um, 
thanks so much for meeting me today for this podcast. It's been really cool. Yeah, we just chatted. It's been fun. Oh, sorry, I was late again. I'll, um... Oh, but it's only 30 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. No, I, I was actually, I, I was when, when you said, oh, I've had a mare with the public transport, and you even called yourself, um, uh, what was it, Tina Tourist? <laughs> Tina Tourist and the message, which, which I, I loved. I'm exactly the same. I cannot get my, I think it's just the way my brain works, works. I can't get my head around the public transport system here. Every time I think I've got it, I'll end up on the bus going somewhere completely wrong, have to get out and Uber back to my mate's place. I'm a nightmare. Are you, are you generally pretty good? I am, I thought I was good. That's I've done, used it a lot. And I sort of get my backpack on and I just love exploring. And I, well, I'm going to go here today and I get the tube and I end up in, I go places and I don't actually do anything, but you feel like you've, been out for the day so today yeah I just made a few bad decisions which um <laughs> yeah anyway I ended up walk, uh, scootering uh, biking tubing and ubering I didn't have to do any of that I could have just done one of those but that's it's, you know it's like a shitty version of the amazing race <laughs> but yeah you made it here in the end oh you, where, do, where do you think you'll settle down Dunedin do you think you'll always be as you uh, because your, your, your brother, does he, he used to work at Snapchat or he worked at Snapchat for a while? Yep, he lives in LA and yeah. works at Snapchat. Do you think you'll be Dunedin? And part of me, like I said to you, when I get to Dunedin, I love it because that's mm. my family and where my friends are. But I feel like, yeah, maybe a bigger city when I'm stopped playing. It's nice now because I go home, I sort of switch off, see my family and I leave. But I think when I'm there permanently, maybe... Yeah, somewhere like Wellington or Auckland might be more appealing. But, mm. yeah, I don't have to think about that just yet. It's like I can pay my cheaper mortgage in Dunedin and <laughs> travel. <laughs> Jeez, with every one of these tournaments, you could just about buy a brand new house in Dunedin. Oh, yeah, I've got to stop spending my money. No, I'm try I am being smarter with it, but, yeah, there's... There's hopefully a couple more years of earning in the game, and then we'll see what happens. Oh, for sure. Yeah, who who is the oldest oldest player to play at the top level? Do many make it to forty? There's a lot of males that have made it to forty. Jimmy Anderson, um, a lot of county cricketers over here. Um, I reckon Matali Raj and Julan Goswami, two of Indians greats, and they've just retired in the last sort of two years. They were close to thirty seven, thirty eight. I don't think. Many have made it to 40. I don't really plan on making it to 40. Um, yeah, it's just a balance. Like we've got a 2020 World Cup next year, and then there's a 50 over World Cup the year after. And, and those are two things in the back of my mind, and you can't plan too much. But mm. um, I know they're there, and if I'm contributing, we'll see how it goes. But after that 50 over World Cup, um, yeah, there's sort of a bit of a break, and you know, there's younger players coming through. So. We'll see what happens. That's kind of, It's in India, and I think it would be really cool to be a part of, but I also know you don't always control that, and I try I not to plan too far ahead. I've just got this game on Saturday and then Caribbean League, which will be fun. Yeah. Well, good luck for the game on Saturday. Hopefully um, hopefully the, the form returns. Yeah, I've been scoring runs just far too slowly. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's either get out or get on with it is my motto for Saturday. Yeah. Oh, Susie Bates, one of the greatest of all time. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and meeting me at the studio in Notting Hill and um, all the best for whatever the future brings. As I've, as I've said numerous times in this chat, I'm sure it's going to be epic. Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Dom.